Okay, okay so wel welcome everybody to uh, this week's One World Seminar. Um, so before I introduce the, the speakers, um, just an advanced um, notice about next week's seminar. So that's the, the final seminar um, of this spring term. Um, then we'll have a short break and then the seminar will start again in the summer term. And the final speakers that we have are um, Hendrik Weber and Trish uh, Gunnaratnam. Um, also, just a, a quick announcement about the, um, the format of today's seminar is um, if you'd like to ask questions during the talk, there are a few ways to do this. Um, either you can write your question into the chat and um, either other experts in the audience can answer it, um, or if it doesn't get answered, then Alessandra or I will alert the speaker uh, to that question. Um, or if you'd like, you can also uh, raise your hand and we'll invite you to, to ask your question at an appropriate point in time. Okay, so um, I think that just leaves uh, me to introduce um, our first speaker today, uh, which is Yves Swan um, from uh, ULB in Belgium, who will be speaking on Stein's density approach. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me correctly? Yep. Good. Uh, so thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Alessandra, for the invitation. Thank you, Gesine, for uh, sharing your spot uh, with me. Uh, I've, speak, I've spoken in many places around the world, but I've actually literally never addressed the whole world in one go, so I'm uh, quite, quite stressed. Um, well, let's get, let's get into it. Uh, I'll be speaking about um, uh, Stein's density approach, which is something I've been working on for a few years now, uh, mainly with Gesina and with several co-authors. Um, the question we try to address is, uh, to put it um, in, in its most general form, is how far are two prob probability distributions? So you're given two probability distributions, P and Q, and you want to know if they are closer, if they are far, if they're very different. Uh, and a natural and very intuitive way to answer this is simply to go ahead and uh, do, do some testing. So here I just wrote a very short code in R the other day. Uh, where I was looking at uh, whether or not R would be able to um, uh, detect a non gaussianity of certain uh, standardized sums. So here in this plot here, I took a standardized sum of Bernoulli's, here I took a standardized sum of geometrics, and here a standardized sum of exponentials. I did just a goodness of fit test of 100 independent observations against the Gaussian. And what you can see here, for example, in the binomial case, is that depending on the value of p, the non-Gaussianity will be harder and harder to detect. Um, so you see here, here, for example, when p is 0 0.5, it, it detects it after uh, n is equal to 20. But for p around 0 0.1, it detects it only after n equals 74. Um, I'm not going to go far on this, this kind of plot, but you can see that Although we know that we know the rate at which the convergence occurs, although we know that we have convergence of this kind of sum to a Gaussian, for fixed n, for fixed observations, it's not so easy to detect non Gaussianity, or it can be very easy to detect non Gaussianity, depending on the, the structure of the, of the underlying distribution. So, uh, as probably everybody here knows, uh, non asymptotic proximity between distributions can be measured in a number of different ways among which we have the total variation distance, the Wasserstein distance, the Kolmogorov distance, uh, which will play a central role in my talk. So the, the total variation distance is just the supremum over all Borel sets of the difference of probabilities. The Kolmogorov distance is a restricted version of the total variation in, in a sense. It's just the supremum over all, uh, well, I'm gonna be staying in dimension one, so let's just take the supremum over, half, over all half lines so supreme of the difference of the uh, CDFs, cumulative distribution functions. And another distance that we will be playing around with a lot is the Wasserstein distance, which is um, given by the, the difference between the, 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 the best coupling of the two distributions and look at the L1 distance, uh, L1 norm of the distance between the two couplings. Other, uh, other ways to measure uh, non-asymptotic proximity or Hellinger distance, Kullback Kleiber divergence, Fisher information distance, and so on. There's many, many, many ways of doing this. And uh, I think a classical reference for those of you who would want to read more about this is the, the, the review paper by Gibson Sue, 
which uh, now dates nearly 20 years ago. Okay, so in this work, uh, we are going to uh, show, um, well, it's, I'm guessing it's becoming more and more classical, but for the moment, let's say it's still not completely classical way of measuring uh, probabilistic uh, differences in terms of what uh, I would call Stein discrepancies. Now, these Stein discrepancies are uh, the, the tip of the iceberg of a, an entire theory, uh, which I call here a suite of techniques that were introduced by uh, the very famous statistician uh, Charles Stein, who passed away uh, not so long ago. And uh, the, the plan of the talk is the following. Um, I'll first give you a Stein identity for the normal. This is probably something that a lot of you know already. Uh, I hope I'll give an angle that is not so classical, but that's, uh, that's the very basics of Stein's method. I will then show you how you can exploit this Stein identity for distributional comparison by using what I call uh, Stein covariance identities, but these are just uh, covariance identities with a certain covariance kernel. And then I'll show how this relates to the previous distances that I showed you by introducing a notion called Stein equations, um, which is also very classical in the theory concerning Stein's method. And then I'll give you applications. I've uh, prepared two, but probably I'd only have time to show you one. So this is a joint work with a bunch of people, among whom uh, Christophe Ley, uh, Benjamin Arras, um, uh, Guillaume Mijoul, and uh, most of it will be based on work with Gisner Reinhardt, who is the second speaker of the afternoon, and a PhD student um, called Marie Ernst. Okay, so let's get into it. Um, the talk will be lots of formulas, so please bear with me, and uh, um, I hope it will stay clear all the time. So here's some computations. Uh, it, it, we all know that uh, a random variable, so univariate here, very simple, univariate distribution. Gazina will do the complicated stuff, I do the easy stuff. Um, univariate distribution normal with mean mu variance sigma squared, well then its density is of this form. But if the density of it is of this form, well we all know that if we take the derivative with respect to y, well then we get a minus uh, y minus mu which appears in front. So in fact this density is a solution to a very simple first order ODE which I write here. The Gaussian density is solution to this differential equation here. Now, obviously, if I integrate with respect to y any function multiplied by this thing here, well, trivially, this here is equal to zero. So if I integrate any function with respect to this differential equation, I get zero for all test functions. The trick, the trick now to get uh, what I call a Stein identity is just to do an integration by parts on this, this part here. So we have two summons. This one, we keep it the same. So this just gives us y minus mu times g of y times p of y. And here we do an integration by parts where we put the derivative and we make it appear in the g. Now, of course, this integration by parts is only allowed under some conditions on g, which I uh, summarize by putting uh, quotation marks around the all. So it's for all appropriate g. We can do the integration by parts. And then we're left with integral of this uh, differential operator applied to g with respect to the Gaussian density is zero. So what I've just shown you is that if a random variable has normal distribution with mean mu and variance sigma square, then the expectation of basically any function g put inside this differential operator with respect to the Gaussian density is equal to zero. This is um, probably the most classical Stein identity available. It's the Stein identity for the Gaussian distribution. It's been uh, known forever, uh, but Charles Stein is perhaps the first one to have been able to exploit it. In, uh, and uh, his exploitation of this, uh, of this identity led to what is now called Stein's method. So to summarize, uh, well, the first theorem that I'm going to show you is due to Charles Stein uh, in the 1970s and says the following. If you define the differential operator T, and this is a MatCal T here, T of G, which sends G to sigma squared G prime minus identity, central identity times G. So that's the, uh, the, the, the operator which will be appearing throughout the first part of my talk. T of G is this guy here. If you define the class F, the set of functions F, which collects all the functions for which you can do the integration by parts. Now this set of functions is this, uh, it's all the functions which satisfy this uh, integrability condition on the derivative. 
Well, then we have just seen that if y has this distribution, necessarily the expectation of this operator is zero. And uh, something that you can also show, but which is not so easy, is that it also works in the other direction. So if this expectation is zero, is zero so if y is any univariate distribution which satisfies this uh, expression, th this equation here for all g in this class, then necessarily y is continuous with the density, and this density is necessarily the normal distribution with mean mu and variance with sigma squared. Okay. Um, this leads to two definitions which will play. So, sorry, can I just interrupt for a second? Yes, uh, Stephen, you had a question. Yes. This is quick, quickly, what, what is uh, P in the integrand there? It's the density of the normal. Uh -huh. So for straight function. Yes. Yeah. It's the density um, uh, of the, the, so it's, it's, um, yeah. Sorry. Um, so it's this guy here. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I see. So it's this, so this, this guy. Yeah, thanks. Why well, rather any further questions? I think that's fine, thanks. Okay. So there's two objects here, one which would be very important for us, one which I will keep hidden um, during most of the talk. Um, so the first is the Gaussian Stein operator. So the Gaussian-Stein operator is a first-order differential operator which sends a function onto, uh, well, uh, th this expression here. And then the second uh, important thing here is what we call the Stein class. And that's the class of functions for which, basically it's the class of functions for which this, this, uh, this identity here holds, okay? Now, Stein's method of normal approximation uh, if you want to summarize it uh, brutally, it's just the collection of tools which allow to exploit uh, this, this expression here, so this expectation over well-chosen functions G in order to assess how Gaussian the distribution of Y is. And the intuition is that if Y is Gaussian, then this is equal to zero. If Y is not Gaussian, then this is not equal to zero. Well, then if y is nearly Gaussian, then this should be nearly equal to zero. And how, how close this is to zero ought to give us an indication on how close this is to the Gaussian. That's the idea. Okay. So if we want to put a package in this, we introduce, uh, I guess it's the last Stein thing I introduced for a while, is the Stein discrepancy. Again, I repeat, the operator is this guy. G, now I take any class of functions and the Stein discrepancy is simply, we look at the expectation of this operator, we integrate respect to some distribution here, and we take the supremum over all functions in a certain set that we decide to use. Now, obviously, again, if Y is Gaussian, this is gonna be zero for any class of well uh, of, of Gs, but uh, if Y is not zero, then, sorry, if Y is not Gaussian, this would not be zero. But it might be impossible to, to, to evaluate. Maybe this is too complicated. If Y has a very complicated distribution, this may be impossible to evaluate for all Gs. Well, then we can maybe choose a better, smaller class of Gs, which will allow us to have some control on this. And whatever control we have on this thing here will give us an intuition on how Gaussian is the thing with respect to which we are integrating. OK? So how can we exploit this? Well, in my talk, I'll keep things um, more or less uh, explicit. So if we look back at the first theorem, we see that if X has, so now it's X has a Gaussian density with mean mu and variance sigma squared, well, then this identity here is satisfied. I separate the two summons. I have this guy here is therefore equal to this guy here. But this, of course, this expectation here is the covariance. So what do we have? We have that if X is Gaussian, then the covariance of x with respect to with, uh, against any function of x is going to be equal to expectation of sigma squared, the variance multiplied by the derivative of uh, this test function. Now, this is called the covariance identity, and it brings us into a very classical topic. I'll just refresh you with two very well known covariance identities. The first you can find in a very nice article by uh, uh, 
so Marin Wendner uh, from 2018, uh, it's, uh, it's the Hilfding uh, covariance identity, which says that if X1 and X2 have joint CDFH, marginal CDFs F1 and F2, well, then the covariance of X1 with respect to G of X2 is equal to expectation of derivative of X2 multiplied by uh, this, uh, I'll call it the covariance kernel here, which is given by the difference of this joint CDF minus the product of the marginal CDFs. Another very famous uh, covariance identity is the Maliavin integration by parts identity, which you can read up on in Jordan Pecati's book from 2011, which says that if X1 and X2 are sufficiently regular functions of a Gaussian process, well, then the covariance here is equal to, well, same thing, we have G prime of X2 multiplied by another uh, covariance uh, kernel. In this talk here, we will be looking at, of course, Stein thingies. So we look at Stein covariance kernel, and what do we say? Well, we say that if we have a distribution, uh, sorry, a random variable which has a density uh, P, well, its Stein covariance kernel is uh, whatever we need to put here in order to have the covariance identity, covariance of X with respect to G of X is the expectation of this thing here multiplied by G prime. Again, in the Gaussian case, this here was just a constant and it was just sigma squared. If X is not Gaussian, well, we have something else which will appear. And this is very classical. There's, it appears already in Stein's uh, monograph from 1986. There's papers on this by Kakoulis, Papatanasiou, and uh, Rutev from the 19, uh, late 80s, early 90s. Um, and so this object here, it's called the Stein kernel. It's, it seems to be quite a, an important object in, uh, for characterizing the distribution of uh, X. Now, to make a long story short, um, because I don't want to spend the whole, uh, the whole hour on this, but starting from here and doing some clever cauchy schwarzing so we cauchy schwartz uh, in the correct way, well, we can get two things. First of all, we can get a lower bound on the variance of the functional of X. How do we do this? Well, this is actually quite easy. Uh, covariance of X, G of X is less than variance of X times variance of G of X. And then we just have uh, this inequality here, which appears. And then a bit more work is necessary here to show that we also have an upper bound here. So what do we see? Well, we see that the variance of a function of a Gaussian uh, sorry, the variance of a function of any uh, distribution x, um, which is sufficiently regular, will be upper bounded by the expectation of the Stein kernel multiplied by the squared derivative and lower bounded by the expectation of the Stein kernel multiplied by the derivative squared. So we have sandwiched our variance of g of x in between two terms, which uh, depend on the derivative of the test function and which are pre-multiplied by the Stein kernel, which I defined before. The Stein kernel is just the object which makes this possible. Now, for those of you who are maybe familiar with this kind of literature, um, sorry, uh, the lower bound is some kind of Kramer-Rau type lower bound, uh, which is uh, very famous, of course, in statistics. And the upper bound is some kind of weighted Poincaré, Poincaré inequality, which is uh, very famous in uh, uh, functional analysis. Um, there's a few recent papers which discuss this. So there's a few papers of, um, well, there's one paper by uh, myself, uh, Marie Ernst, and uh, Gesine Reinhardt, which is uh, very recent. There's also a paper by uh, Adrien Somar, the same Somar that I talked about just before, which is in Bernoulli in 2019. And there's a very, very beautiful paper by uh, Ledoux Nordin Pecati in 2015, where they, 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 ex they explore the consequences of this and the properties of these time curls also in higher. Dimensions. So we have another question um, saying, how do we know the sine kernel exists? Uh, in dimension one, it's just a condition on the, the, the regularity of the density. In uh, higher dimensions, it's, uh, it's a very good question. Uh, there's a Is few papers coming out on this. It's actually a very good question, and it depends on the definition you decide to give. Yeah, in we one talk dimension, about that, actually. So Gesine will talk about that. So in one dimension, and I'm staying in one dimension, uh, it can be quite easy. So for example, if, the, if you have a normal, well, we already know that the Stein kernel is constant. What's interesting is that having a constant Stein kernel is actually a characterization of the Gaussian distribution. 
Another example is if we put, if we get ourselves back into the situation of the Höfting Coderis bounds, well, then we can get a starting kernel for free by simply conditioning on what was appearing in this coherence uh, relationship. And if we put ourselves in the Nobudan Piketty uh, Maliavan integration by parts, well, we also get a standard kernel for free by conditioning, uh, taking conditional expectations of what was appearing in the Nobudan Piketty covariance, uh, covariance eigenvalue. Now, with uh, Gesina and uh, Marie, we also showed that um, basically for any density P which is connected and not too savage at its borders, so we don't want it to go to infinity too fast, but that's basically all. Well, the Stein kernel exists and it has this very, very lovely form. It's perfectly explicit. You simply integrate with respect to two independent copies of your distribution. And if you don't believe me, uh, you can open Mathematica and uh, take x1 and x2, which are independent Gaussians. You integrate this. So this is an indicator function. You integrate x1 going up to little x, same x as here, and you integrate x2 starting from little x to little b. And you do this double integral. And you will see that in the Gaussian case, this is constant and equal to sigma squared. OK? Of course, this is not always easy to compute. That's a different question. But it exists, and it is that, that, that thing there. OK. How, do we, how can we use this for uh, doing distributional comparison, which was obviously the, the subject of my talk? Well, again, recall the Gaussian operator, which was sending g to sigma squared g prime. Sorry, the prime should be here, minus x times g. I've taken uh, mean zero, so mu is zero now. And uh, well, let's take a very simple toy example, which I will use throughout the talk, which is the student distribution. So it's explicit, it's continuous, it has support, which is the full real line, everything is uh, easy. And if you compute the expression I gave you just before, you can see that the Stein kernel has this nice polynomial, second degree polynomial form. So the Stein kernel of the student distribution with new degrees of freedom is x squared plus nu divided by nu minus one. It's only valid for nu larger than one. Okay, now let's look at the Stein discrepancy from the student distribution to the Gaussian distribution over some class of unspecified functions g, which are just supposed to be good enough for doing whatever I want to do. Now this is what? It's this agreement over, over all g's of uh, this, uh, this expression here. That's by definition. Now I separate my summons. This here is going to be the covariance. And now I just use the definition of the Stein kernel. The Stein kernel is the thing by which you have to multiply the derivative in order to go from here to here. So I just replace this guy by this guy. I can do that because that's the definition of the Stein kernel. And what do I have now? Well, I'm left with um, something which I just have the difference of sigma squared and of the student Stein kernel multiplied by g prime. Now let's dream of it. Let's dream and suppose that we are allowed to take g, which has derivative, which is less than one. You might be thinking, well, that's a very savage assumption, as I will show you. It's not. It's actually very, a very natural assumption. Let's suppose that g prime is less than one, so that I can uniformly bound this away. Take it out. What have I just shown? Well, I've shown that the Stein discrepancy between the student and the Gaussian, when I look over the set of functions should have derivative less than one, well, this time discrepancy is bounded by this expression here, which has no g in it. There's no g, there's no supreme. It's just a, this is just an integral. And uh, well, I didn't do that by hand. Of course, I did it with Mathematica. You plug this into Mathematica, you integrate this expression with respect to the student, and you get 2 over nu minus 2. Now, what does this tell us? It tells us that as nu grows, this expression here goes to 0. So this time discrepancy goes to 0. So the student Stein discrepancy to the Gaussian is going to zero. That's something we know. We know that the student distribution becomes the Gaussian for large degrees of freedom. So something seems to be happening here which is coherent, coherent with what we would expect. Now, um, of course, this is just for uh, continuous distribution for the moment. You might be wondering, can I do this for discrete distribution? I might be wanting to compare a binomial with a Gaussian. Can I do that? Well. If you're looking at n value distributions, so distributions valued in the, with values in the integers, 0, 1, 2, and, and so on, well, the most natural derivative, I guess, is not the strong derivative f prime. It would be the discrete forward or backward differences, uh, which send f onto f of x plus 1 minus f of x, or f of x minus f, minus f of x minus 1. So you're looking at the distribution on the integers, but you're going to look at the differences between two consecutive steps. This is uh, for many reasons, this is the most natural derivative to use when you're working with uh, n-value distribution. 
Well, it seems quite uh, also intuitive that then uh, when you could define a discrete covariance kernel, Stein covariance kernel, which would be just whatever you need to put here in order to have a covariance identity where you have, a, a, on the left, it's the same expression, covariance of x with g of x, but now you don't have g prime, but you have this uh, forward or backward difference, okay? So the discrete Stein kernel would just be whatever you need to put here in order to have this covariance identity. So we're working a bit by analogy with what we did in the, in the continuous case. And we just replaced the derivative g prime by this forward or backward derivative. Okay. Now, uh, what was quite nice for us, so this is not new. This, this, this Stein kernel is, uh, this discrete Stein kernel is not new. It's known since the works of uh, people like uh, Asendras, Papadatas, Papadanasiu, and uh, many others. Uh, what is new is, uh, I guess, is uh, the, the result that we got with Gizina, which shows that, in fact, that this, this, this discrete Stein kernel has exactly the same expression as the continuous Stein kernel when you look at it in this representation here. So what we see here, well, we see the same thing, expectation of independent copies with respect to the distribution under which you're working, multiplied by this indicator. The only difference between the continuous case and the discrete case is that in the discrete case, you have to be careful whether you have a little uh, less or equal here or here. And less or equal here or here will tell you if you're working with respect to the forward derivative or the backward derivative. That's all. And again, uh, my, my, my favorite tool is Mathematica. So plug this guy here in Mathematica for Poisson, and you will get that you have one of the discrete Stein kernels is constant. Another one is just the identity. If you plug in the binomial, you'll see that uh, the corresponding Stein kernel is just n minus x, and uh, this one here is just uh, 1 minus p times x. Um, so if you like this kind of stuff, you can look up these papers by these people. You can also look up a paper by uh, Oliver Johnson and Ewan Ilion uh, in 2011, I think, where they look at the connection between these discrete derivatives and uh, discrete Poincaré inequalities for the binomial distribution. Again, I, I won't take the time to go into this in detail here. Okay, so how can we use this to compare a binomial with a normal? So remember for the student distribution, what we had done is we had said that this is the Gaussian-Stein operator. This was the student, uh, the student um, Stein kernel. And then we just plug this into the, 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 the expression of the covariance, uh, sorry, in the, in the expression of the Stein discrepancy. Well, basically the same thing works for the comparison of a binomial and normal. How? Well, I, I now look at a standardized normal. So the sigma squared is gone, the x minus mu is gone. This is the standardized Stein uh, operator for the standard normal. And I take uh, xn, which is binomial with uh, degrees of freedom n and p. I'm working with fixed n, fixed p. Everything is fixed, nothing is, nothing is asymptotic here. Now, I want to compare my binomial with a normal. Well, what do I do? I standardize. So I withdraw the mean and divide by the standard deviation. And I know that this should be roughly uh, normal with mean zero and variance one. OK, so what do I do? I take my Stein discrepancy. That's my Stein discrepancy. And um, I would like to have a covariance identity working on this guy to bring me the Stein kernel of uh, this guy. But here, the most natural derivative is not the forward or the backward derivative. It's not, it's not either the strong derivative. The most natural derivative is the derivative working on the set of values 0 minus np uh, divided by square root of npq up to n minus np divided by square root of npq. Because xn is valued on the integers, so y is valued on the set, uh, which is just the standardized integers in a sense. So the derivative here will be the derivative which is restricted to the set of values taken by y. Now I'll uh, spare you the detail because they are a bit, uh, a bit, a bit uh, cumbersome, but uh, it, it is not impossible to obtain a discrete Stein kernel for the standardized binomial with respect to this derivative. It has an expression that you can write out. It's not even too long. But then if I do this, I go back into my covariance, uh, into my Stein discrepancy, and I withdraw the, the expression which appears. And now what do I have? I have g prime minus this Stein kernel multiplied by this derivative. So in the student case, if you remember, we had derivative and derivatives. So we could take it out, and we were happy. 
Here we don't have the derivative, we have something else. But we can tailor expand this something else. Remember, this something else is just g of x plus one over square root of n minus g of x. So if we tailor expand this guy, well, some computations later, which I will skip, we get that the um, Stein discrepancy is upper bounded by something which is perfectly explicit. So this is for fixed n, for fixed p, we get that the Stein discrepancy here is bounded by this expression as long as the functions g that we're working with are bounded with bounded derivative and bounded second derivative. Now you might be thinking, okay, that's, uh, that's pretty but uh, not very useful and because it doesn't tell us anything on any meaningful distance. Well, uh, okay, let's, let's, let's admit that first for, for a moment, but I hope that I have convinced you uh, in this half hour that as long as the class of functions on which you're working is containing nice functions, bounded, bounded derivatives, that kind of stuff, well then these Stein discrepancies where we have the Gaussian Stein operator for various values of the mean and, this, and the variance, uh, this Gaussian Stein discrepancy is explicit. Uh, well, sharp we don't know yet, so maybe I shouldn't have put this here. It's not asymptotic and it allows for many handles, for example, in terms of these covariance identities that I actually now, a natural question at this stage is, do there exist nice classes G such that this guy here is actually relevant? And the answer is, of course, yes. Otherwise, it wouldn't be interesting to talk about. So how do we see this? So far, so good. Everybody's uh, happy? Okay. So how do, we, how do we go from this strange time discrepancy to something relevant? Well, um, it goes through something called the Stein equation. It's also something that would be um, appearing a lot in, uh, in Gazina's talk. Um, so, well, to justify this, let's start back at the basics. I told you that we would be working with the Wasserstein distance. So the Wasserstein distance is a natural measure of distance between probability distributions. Uh, I write Vas PQ or Vas XY according to my uh, needs. I'm not very careful with this. And uh, you probably know that the Wasserstein distance is the, the, you take the difference of the CDFs and you look at the integral of the difference of the CDFs. You can also look at the integral of the difference of the quantile functions. You can also look at this coupling expression. And in this talk, I will be using this expression here. So one can show, it's not so easy, that the Wasserstein distance, so this thing here, is actually equal to the supremum over all test functions H which have bounded, uniformly bounded first derivative of these differences of expectations. So here you integrate with respect to P and here you integrate with respect to Q, the same function, meaning the supremum over all functions which have bounded first derivative. Now we are going to show that this here can be written as a Stein discrepancy. So I'll start again. We can show that this here can be written as a Stein discrepancy over a simple set G. So that means that whatever we did before, so I only had two toy examples, the student and the binomial, but whatever you can do in these time discrepancies will immediately translate onto Wasserstein distance. How is that possible? Well, uh, I'll show you a theorem. So I, I, I give you the version of the theorem, which is due to Marie Ernst and Gesine and myself, but it's, it's a classical theorem. Uh, the only new thing is that we have this, this, this part here. But basically the idea is the following. You start with your test functions here, H, you look at h of little x minus the expectation of h of capital X, where x is a Gaussian. So this is what? Well, this is a centered, centered version of the test function little h. And what the theorem says is that for any h which is Lipschitz with Lipschitz constant 1, there exists a unique function f, which is solution to the differential, first order differential equation, which you see here. Now here you recognize the difference of uh, h with the expectation, and here, I, I think I insisted enough on this. This is the Gaussian Stein operator, sigma squared derivative minus identity times uh, function. This solution is actually explicit. And what Gesine and uh, Marie and I were able to show is that this solution is given by this expression here. Now, if you remember, the Stein kernel was looking very similar to this. The difference with the Stein kernel is that we had no h and we just had expectation of x2 minus x1. Here we have expectation of h of x2 minus h of x1 and x1 and x2 are still iid copies of a norm. And moreover, this function here, fh, it's bounded with bounded first derivative. And um, yeah, well, actually, this is not, I think I made, I made a small typo. This function here is, is, 
Yeah, and it's more tattoo. It's not bound. It's, it's it doesn't have bounded derivative. It's bounded by the by the starting kernel, um, but you, you can bound its first derivative and you can bound its second derivative. Um, these bounds are actually optimal, and there's a paper by uh, Christian Durbler in 2015 in uh, Electronic Journal of Probability, which shows you a lot of things that you can say about these functions without making too many assumptions on the test functions h. Now let's go back into my uh, Wasserstein distance. So this Wasserstein distance here, well, it's the supremum of the, over the differences of these expectations here. Well, what do I do? The first thing I go from here to here, simply by taking the expectation around uh, these two guys. So here I have h of y minus expectation of h of x in parentheses. Now, if I look back at my Stein equation, my Stein equation was uh, that sigma squared fh of prime of y minus one minus mu times fh was equal to this. So here I simply replace this difference here by the Stein operator. And what do I have? Well, I have that the Wasserstein distance is actually, well, it's what? It's, uh, it's a Stein discrepancy. It's a Stein discrepancy over a class of functions which are solutions to Stein equations. And because these solutions are nice and nicely bounded, well, you can actually upper bound this Stein discrepancy in terms of solutions of Stein equations by a Stein discrepancy over nicer functions. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, it means that all the bounds that we got previously, we can use them directly as bounds on the Wasserstein distance, for example, in, when you're comparing a student to a standard normal, or when you're computing, comparing a standardized binomial to a standard normal. So this gives us a rate of convergence of the student towards a standard normal uh, in Wasserstein distance and a rate of convergence of the standardized binomial to the normal in terms of Wasserstein distance and the upper bounds are perfectly explicit. Of course, you don't have to work with explicit distributions like the one that I gave. You can work with the Stein discrepancy uh, even under much less favorable circumstances. So you get a lot of bounds which can be immediately translated into bounds on the Wasserstein distance. So, um, and then maybe I just give you a quick plot of what this bound looks like. This one here, so I just plotted for various values of p. So p is 0, 2, that's this one. 0, 5, that's this one. 0, 9 is this one. What you see is that it's not very, uh, it's not very precise, of course, because the, the, this bound here is only less than 1 for n larger than uh, 80 in the p 0, 2 case. So it's, it's not super satisfactory at this stage, but it still gives us a, a, a rate of convergence in this in this toy. Okay, so far so good. Okay, so we had done, we we worked with the Wasserstein distance by restricting to on the right hand side we had the Lipschitz test functions, but there's no need to do need, there's no need to restrict to Lipschitz test functions. You can work with any kind of test functions here, and you will get a Stein discrepancy here. So any of these, they're called integral probability metrics. Insofar as you can solve the Stein equation, any integral probability metric can be written as a Stein discrepancy. So integral probability metrics, Stein discrepancies, basically the same story. So all these bounds that you can get from Stein discrepancies will also give you bounds, for example, on total variation distance, where your test functions is indicators of Borel sets, or Kolmogorov distance, where your test functions are indicators of half lines. Okay. So uh, what we were, an example of the bounds that you, that you can obtain, it's on a paper by Marie and myself, um, is that if you're looking at comparing uh, some distribution xn to the normal, which satisfies some regularity conditions on the density, well then you can upper bound the Wasserstein, the total variation and the Kolmogorov by expressions of this form. So for example, here you would recognize the difference of the Stein kernel of your distribution with one. And here, what you see, when you see the difference of the Gaussian score with the score of your uh, distribution Vn. And you have explicit constants K, C1, C2, kappa 1, kappa 2. So we can get bounds. It's particularly easy whenever Xn is explicit. You can get bounds on Wasserstein to variation in Kolmogorov, which will depend on what? Well, they will depend on the Stein kernel and uh, the, the score function. So this brings us now to uh, a theory, uh, which uh, you could call a theory of everything, because we only considered Gaussian approximation with Gaussian Stein discrepancy and Gaussian Stein operator. But uh, one of the appeals of Stein's method is that everything that works for the Gaussian 
also works for basically any target distribution. The only thing that you have to do is you have to use a different operator for every target that you want to look at, you will use the adapted uh, operator for your target. So um, the, the take, take home message of this part is to say that Stein discrepancies, well, they are explicit, they are non-asymptotic, they are relatively easy to use, and they allow you to cover many approximation problems. If you change the class of functions, you change the distance that you're looking at, and if you change the operator, you change the target with respect to which you're doing your approximation problem. So if you want to do a Poisson approximation, you use a Poisson operator. If you want to do a beta approximation, you use a beta operator, and so on and so on. Now, this is not new either. Uh, Stein operators for arbitrary distributions P can be found in a number of ways. There's the so-called generator approach, the perturbation approach, couplings, covariance identities, that's what I showed you. There's many more. And Stein's method is available for uh, many, many, many distributions. Uh, famous examples are the, the Poisson, which is due to Chen in the 1970s, compound Poisson, binomial, multivariate normal, multinomial, gamma, Laplace, beta, variance gamma, Dickman, stable, uh, and so on and so on and so on. As you can see, the research is not stopping. So it starts in the 70s and it's still going on right now. Take a distribution, you'll try to find an operator. Um, I, I'm trying to maintain a website, but I'm not doing a very good job where I keep track of whatever is uh, appearing. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm running late in my website, so if you want me to update and if you have things that you want me to update, please send me an email. There's also um, uh, a chapter in Chen Goldstein and Shao's book, which is dedicated to non-normal approximation with Stein's method. And uh, Gesine and I, with Christoph Lang, we have a review paper which you may find useful on this uh, non-Gaussian uh, Stein operator, uh, Stein, uh, Stein's method. So how do we get operators uh, for non-Gaussian case? Well, the, my, my, my enthusiasm goes for what we call Stein's density approach. And it's due to Stein. And because of lack of time, I'll just give you a very quick overview of how it works. So as we saw, we, when we were working with the student distribution, we wanted to work with the strong derivative. When we were working with the binomial distribution, we wanted to work with the forward or backward derivative, but standardized. But we could also work with uh, other kinds of derivatives. And basically, if you have a distribution which you want to approximate with another, start by choosing your derivative of choice, whichever it is. Gesine would be working in a multivariate setting, so she would be working with gradients and direction, uh, direction derivatives. And from this choice of derivative, we define what we call the canonical operator, which is given by uh, the application of a sending, sending a test, a function g, to tg of x, which is the derivative of g times the density divided by the density. And if you check it out for the Gaussian, it gives you back to what we were expecting as the operator for the Gaussian distribution. With this, you can construct what we call the Stein class. And this Stein class is basically the collection of functions for which this thing here has expectation zero. Now, this gives us conditions on the border behaviors of G. If the density is complicated at the border, then G has to be very nice to compensate for the nastiness of P at the border. Once we have this guy and this guy, well, we can construct the Stein kernels. And the idea is you're going to work out your Stein, sorry, the Stein discrepancies. And you're going to work out your Stein discrepancies for good functions G. And once you have your Stein discrepancies, well, basically, you have fun. Uh, look at covariance identity, look at Stein equations, look at couplings, look at whatever you want to look at to find a way to extract from this information, from this thing here, information on the proximity of whatever you're looking at with the law of whatever you're looking at in whatever distance you're interested in. Uh, if you want an overview, well, again, uh, there's a paper with uh, Christophe and uh, Gesine, and there's another paper with uh, Guillaume Mijoul and Gesine, which is on the archive. Okay. Uh, as expected, I won't have time to cover this application, so I skip it. And I go back, to, I go to the last question which I want to address. It's uh, how sharp are these bounds? Are these bounds? So I hope you're convinced that uh, with some tweaking around, it's a very versatile way of measuring distances between distributions. And uh, one of the reasons why the method become, became famous uh, and very useful is that it's good for, for example, when you have situations where you have dependency. Because everything is explicit, you can actually work out the dependency structures and still get rates of convergence in more complicated settings, uh, something that is virtually impossible, uh, for example, when you're working with characteristic functions. 
But then the natural question, the question that uh, we get all the time is how sharp are your bones? And the answer is, um, well, uh, it's complicated. So these time discrepancies control distances between distributions. Are these bones sharp? Well, the answer is in general, they are of the correct order, but not good in the constants. At least they will not be as good as methods which would have been developed specifically for the application in mind. Stein's method, these Stein discrepancies are very general. They can be applied to many, many problems. So you lose something in the constants. Um, here's an example. Again, I, I like looking at the student versus the normal. That's the, the, the example I'm working with throughout the, 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 the talk. So again, we look at the total variation distance between the student distribution and the standardized normal. And uh, with uh, Gesina and my method, we get um, we get this bound here, which I showed you, two over new minus two. But there's a very beautiful paper by uh, Dumkin, Samwert, and Wellner, uh, which uh, appeared uh, in 2020, wherein they showed that actually you can upper bound the total variation distance with a totally different method. They showed a bound of order one over two times new. And there's a paper by Pinellis in, the, in 2015 who looks at exactly the same problem, and he gets an optimal bound, which is of the order 0 0.158 divided by new. So if we compare our bound with uh, Dumkin, Samuel, Weller's bound and uh, Pinellis' bound, well, we are very bad. We are up here. Uh, they are down here, and uh, Pinellis is uh, basically optimal uh, down here. So the bound is not good in the constants. It's the correct order, but not good in the constants. But, and that's the last thing I want to say, so I'm basically on time. Um, the problem is that we are being too coarse. As I was saying, we upper bound the functions. And so there's these, these test functions which appear. There are solutions to these Stein equations. Now, what do we do? Well, we look at these equations, these solutions. That's what they look like. So this is the, the function. That's its derivative. And what do we do? We, we, in, in our bounds, we just say, OK, let's take out everything which appears with g and upper bound it by the maximum value of g. So we take the maximum value, and then we take it out. And then we get a bound. So our function, which is this guy here, we actually upper bound it by a constant, which is a uniform constant over the whole range of x. But that's very coarse. And uh, in uh, the paper with Marie, we looked at uh, not using the, the uniform bounds, but using non-uniform bounds and seeing what happens there, and still uh, concluding with the example of a student versus the normal. What we see is that if we use a non-uniform bound, well, um, we get, uh, I can show you here. So that's, that's the bound I was talking to you about, the first one, which is not so good. This is the bound by uh, Dumkin, Samwert, and Wellner. And if we use a non-uniform bound, well, we, that may be quite happy. We are just below. So we have a bound which seems to be slightly better than the, the very elegant bound by Dumkin, uh, Wellner, and, and Samwert. Of course, uh, we are very far from the optimal bound by Pinellas. So there must be something that we're losing here. I don't really know where. But what we can do is we can also do Wasserstein. We're not stuck with total variation. We can also do Wasserstein. And here we see that using this bound here, we get uh, the, the, the red curve that I show you here. And that's very, very close to actually the exact value of the Wasserstein distance. So it seems that we're doing a good job. Um, I'll stop here. Uh, here are a few references. So there's the papers with um, Marie and Gesina, uh, which are quite recent, so 20 and 21. The paper by uh, Dimkin, Samwert, and Wellner, which uses it's basically the same topic as this one, but with a very different, uh, very different approach. There's a paper by Soma, if you're interested in the, the Poincaré inequalities and relation with Stein kernels, and then there's a paper by Ludwig and Piketty on the connection between Stein kernels and the uh, logarithmic sub Sabalev and transport inequalities. And uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for that. So I'll just invite everyone to um, unmute themselves and then we can uh, thank you, Vic. So if you have any questions, um, two ways to, to ask them. Either you can type them in the chat and I'll relay them to, to you, Vic, or if you want to, um, you can raise your hand uh, using the raise hand icon uh, and I'll invite you to, uh, to unmute yourself and, and ask your question. Okay, so are there, are there any questions? I can see the chat. Um, it doesn't matter whether you can see it. If you, I, I can read it out to you if you, if you can't see Sorry. it. How you obtain the value of the distance for the student distribution? 
it was written, it's equal to one over mama nine, new minus two, but how it was obtained? Uh, which one? Student, student from Gaussian. Uh, the, 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 the uh, distance between student and Gaussian, yes, it was just, just in the beginning. In ah. the beginning, student and Gaussian, but how it was calculated. Well, it so was the, the, the beginning of the lecture. If you compare, compare student and Gaussian. Yeah, I'll, I'll find it. Uh... It was a number, but how it was, number was obtained. Yeah, it, so I'll, I'll find it and show it. Um, where is it? It's here. No, so it, this... Oh, yes. How, how, how it appeared, yes. Uh, so I mean, this this is a it's it's a it's actually quite a trivial problem. Once you once you write here, it's actually quite trivial. This is just the integral of this function with respect to the student distribution, mm. and then just integrate. And, with respect uh, to what? with respect to Gaussian or with respect to no, what? with respect to student. With respect to student. Student. Ah. Yeah. So you just mm. write. Uh, so yes. Yeah, um, uh, Maybe I can actually I can even write it. So you just um, you just integrate this function here. With respect to the student distribution. And uh, then this will give you this exact value here. Exact? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I must admit I, I cheated. I used Mathematica for that. Thanks. I plug, I plug it into Mathematica and press enter and I wait for the answer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, do we have some other questions? Uh, yes, there's one in the chat um, saying, are there other methods to compare discrete and continuous distributions than comparing their Stein kernels? Uh, in terms of Stein's method, yes, uh, you can, uh, but that's something Gazzini will talk about, I think, a bit. It's, uh, there's a lot of flexibility in the, in, the, in the Stein operators. I didn't show this flexibility, but uh, basically starting with uh, the Stein operators, you can obtain a, a full family of, um, of uh, Stein, Stein expressions. And then you can optimize by not necessarily comparing the Stein, the script, the Stein kernels, but other things that you can obtain. You can actually optimize. Uh, Gesina and uh, Larry Goldstein have a paper on this uh, in 2013, I think, where they do they compare the beta distribution with uh, something arising from the uh, an earn model. And so for the beta distribution, they have the Stein kernel, but for the earn model, they have. Uh, it's, it's slightly different, but then it, it also works out quite well. And I think there's, a, there's also a paper by Larry Goldstein and Jason Fullman where they do something similar in the discrete case. But uh, how you compare the uh, derivative and, and the, the, the difference and the discrete derivative, uh, how it was obtained? Because you only apply it to one. Yeah, good, good. Uh, yes, uh, you apply. Discrete derivative and uh, usual derivative. Exactly. How how it's compare? Exactly. So we have on the one hand we have the strong derivative, and we'll be comparing it with this derivative here. So the idea is you just say, well, you Taylor expand this guy. So this minus this is equal to uh, one over square root of n p q times g prime, and then you have a remainder term. So mm -hmm. you have the, deriv the, the derivatives, then you have the remainder terms, and you just control mm -hmm. these two, and you show that they go to zero. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So, I, guess yeah, I, I think that the nicest example of that is in Gazina's paper, uh, sorry to interrupt, uh, with, where they do the, 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 the beta versus the polya Eggenberger. And they, they have these two derivatives that coexist, and then miraculously, everything goes away and gives a very, very beautiful uh, explicit rate of convergence. Hmm. Uh, Gesine, yeah. I think you had your hand up earlier. Do you have a question? Um, yes, actually, I have a question. Uh, something that occurred to me when you showed these results for the Stein kernels and the um, uh, solution of the Stein equation in terms of x1 and x2. So in principle, we could simulate the solution of the Stein equation and we could simulate the uh, um, Stein kernel by simulating x1 and x2 and um, estimating the expectation by the average. Yeah. 
Yeah, for yeah. example, in this solution, yeah, right? we, we could simulate my, so, so we could uh, look at other um, distributions. So we probably don't want to simulate from the normal, but if you've got something complicated, then we could simulate the solution of the Stein equation and we can simulate the Stein kernel. Yeah, I agree. The only problem is that uh, uh, if you're working with the, the, the basic Stein equation, you'll have it divided by P here. So if you don't know your P, you're stuck for your simulation. Uh, but when you're working with the Stein kernel equation, which you would be talking about, the solution is actually a ratio. So there's no div division by P, and now you can simulate. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, you can simulate the solutions. I've never tried. Yeah, I think it would be interesting perhaps to try out what that would look like. So I have a little question about um, these identities that you showed um, involving the um, expectation of the two independent random variables. If you have two, two identities. Yeah. So, so, so these seem to me, you know, they're very elegant looking identities and, 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 and you sort of convinced me that they're quite useful. But what really surprised me was that they're so recent, you know, that they've only been discovered in 2020. Are, they very, are the proofs very technical? No, no, no. I, I, sorry. I, I think they're, they're not recent. Um, they're known. Uh, I mean, uh, everything's uh, it's, it dates back to the 40s. And uh, if you look at it closely, it actually contains what we're doing. What's probably new or newish uh, is how to use that in the context of Stein's method. And when you combine the two, well, Stein's method works well for comparing distributions. These, Stein, these covariance identities are very, very efficient, very elegant, and they're very, I, I, I guess they're quite deep. And then the two connected just make, uh, make for a lot of applications. But uh, I, I, no, no, I'm, I mean, these identities are not new. And I'm actually quite surprised that, um, so something like this, uh, I, I mean, it's, it's, so, it's, it's so pretty that I, it probably exists somewhere already. Uh, just, it's in the context of Stein's method that it's uh, new. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any last questions that anyone would like to ask? Okay, I'm, I'm not seeing any other questions. I think this is a, a good time to uh, to pause. So what we'll do now is um, we'll we'll break for five minutes, and um, and Gazine will start it at five past the the hour. And just before we we leave to have a quick coffee break, um, I'd just like to ask everyone to unmute themselves uh, once more and and thank Evik for his uh, very lovely talk. Thank you. Thank you. Stop sharing. Come on. Hey, thanks. Gisine, if you wanted to share your screen before the break, so you. Okay. Um... Okay, great. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. So, how, how long is the break? Five minutes. Sir. Five and, minutes. Okay. Uh, five past four, we start again. Oh, my four. <laughs> it's not your four. Okay. Five past at the hour. Good. I just stepped out and had my own personal break because I was afraid that I, I didn't want to be late for my talk. <laughs>
we still have two minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, so I think it's time. So welcome everybody again. So first a very short announcement. So next week we will have the seminars of Trisha Guna Ratman and Hendrik Bebe. And now it's a pleasure to have here Kesine Reiner. Uh, she will uh, talk about the Stein's method for multivariate continuous distributions and some statistical applications. Okay, thanks, please. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a, it's a great opportunity to spread the word about Stein's method. So I, this talk will um, mostly build on EVIC's talk, but we will go over the basics again quickly. There are two differences. Um, first, it will be multivariate, not univariate. Uh, secondly, it will be just continuous distributions. We won't cover the discrete case. So um, here's the outline. So we talk about Stein's method um, uh, in general, then we talk about multivariate continuous distribution, higher dimensions, then we talk about Stein kernels in more detail than we've done already, see how we can use that for Wasserstein distance. Then we will um, introduce weak Stein solutions. And in the end, we talk about how this all connects to Shore, which is the Stein unbiased risk estimator and shrinkage. So here's a brief um, summary of what Stein's method is for many people. So we have a target distribution mu. We find a suitable operator A and a large class of functions f of A, such that X has distribution mu, if and only if for all functions in this class f of A, the expectation of the operator A f of X is zero. So then we find, so, so this class f of A was called the Stein class in uh, Evix talk. Then we find a measure de determining class on the support of mu, such as Lipschitz functions, and a solution of the Stein equation um, be, be equal h of x, x minus expectation h of capital X equal a f of x. So capital X has the target distribution mu. We fix h and we find a function f such we have this, uh, this, this solves this equation. So why is this useful? Because then we can replace um, we've got any random variable w, replace x by capital W, take expectations, and we get the expectation h of w minus the expectation h of x equals the expectation of a f of w. And quite often we are interested in bounding the left-hand side, say for example for Lipschitz functions or for um, indicator functions of convex sets, and then it suffices to bound at the, the right-hand side, this equation. So this has nothing to do, th this is true in any dimension. This is just the general framework. So in, in one dimension, Evig already talked about the density approach. So uh, to find a, a Stein equation or a Stein operator, um, we, we use the Stein operator TPF. So P, P is the PDF, F is the function that we, the operator acts on. So in this, this operator is just FP prime divided by P. So this operator is actually quite popular um, for people who have uh, PDFs P, which have an untractable normalizing constant, because if you've got a normalizing constant in this operator, it just cancels out. So if we've got functions F such that the integral over 
um, fp prime of x dx is zero, then obviously the expectation of this operator is zero. And so we've got a Stein operator. And we have a Stein equation h of x minus expectation h of capital X equal to TPF of x. We can write down the solution in closed form. Now, Evic has already written down a solution which looked different to this one, but I can assure you it is the same solution. This is the analytic form of the solution or an analytic form of the solution. So we take one over minus one over P of X and then we integrate from minus infinity to X of P of Y uh, times H of X taking away the expectation H of capital X. And again, if you've got a normalizing constant P which is intractable, uh, we are not worried because it would cancel. So an example we've already seen. So the uh, standard normal density um, here I've denoted it by phi um, because I will use gamma later uh, for something slightly different. So then the this standard normal density has phi prime equal to minus x times phi. So this operator um, t phi t phi f, which is f phi prime of, of x divided by phi of x, is then just f prime of x minus x f of x, and that's the operator which you've already seen in Evix talk. So, um, but that's not the only operator we can look at because we have the product rule from, from uh, analysis, right? Um, Fg prime is F prime G minus uh, Fg prime. So with this product rule, um, we have, so I can look at that TPF, Fp prime, then I can look at Tp of F times G and I get uh, th this equality expectation G prime F um, an expectation is minus the expectation of G times TPF, as long as the, the integral of a GFP prime dx vanishes in, in, the, uh, in the product rule term. So I've got another Stein equation. So H of X minus expectation of couple X is F of X G prime of X plus G of X TPF of X. So this is now solved by pairs of functions F and G such that F times G is the solution of the Stein equation. Now you might think this is just more complicated. Why would this be advantageous? So F and G is unique. So it's F times G is unique. So this is the solution, but the individual F and G are not unique. So in particular um, with the uh, Evig and uh, Christoph Ley, we've shown that we can actually fix a function F if, uh, if um, if it's regular in, in the sense which I'm not going to talk about. And um, just look at the Stein operator as, a func as an operator in G. So for example, so uh, in Fx, G prime of X plus G of X, TPF of X, if I fix F of X equal to one, I get G prime of X plus G of X and what I call rho of X, rho of X is just TP one of X. So it's P prime over P, which is the score function. So for for a normal variable with mean zero and variance sigma squared, we obtain the operator f prime of x minus one over sigma squared x f of x. So similarly, if I go back to this equation with the f and g, um, maybe I want to take a different f, maybe I take the f such that tpf is nu minus x. So that the, the second term is sort of simple. So I get but mu, mu is the mean, so we get mu minus x g of x. And then of course we get f of x g of prime of x. And because f of x is so natural, it's got a special name, it's uh, called the Stein kernel and we denote it by two of x like Evig did. So two is um, the inverse of the Stein operator of mu minus the identity. So this Stein kernel uh, actually is already hidden in, in work by Charles Stein from 1986. Uh, Kalkulas, Papadana, Ziu, uh, and Ute have, have a, a range of papers. So this the Stein kernel is something that has been around for a long time, although not necessarily viewed with this angle. And for an, uh, a normal variable with mean zero variance sigma squared, we get sigma squared f prime of x minus x f of x. So you see, that's almost the, the equation we got for f equal to one, except that the sigma squared is in a different place. Now for the normal, this doesn't make a huge amount of difference, but 
uh, we've seen, for example, in the beta distribution, um, it made a lot of difference because in one var variation, we would divide by something that has a singularity at zero. And we could just using with, with this F times G trick, we can get rid of the singularity. So that was the, really the highlights from Stein's method uh, in general and for univariate. How about multivariate? So for multivariate distributions, uh, Stein's approach has been developed um, using what's called the generator approach, which I um, don't think we've, we've talked about. So um, Barber and Götze looked at multivariate normal distributions and diffusions. Lanzmann, Van Duffel and Yao looked at multivariate elliptical distributions, although not necessarily calling it Stein's method. Um, Gorman and Mackey looked at strictly log concave densities. Uh, Garn, Verlin and Ross at Dirichlet distribution. And there's also some work on discrete multivariate distribution by uh, Andrew Barber, Marvina Luchak, and Ayuaksha. Um, Yang et al. in context of machine learning, and I've done something with uh, Nathan Ross on uh, exponential random graph model and Isaac models. So, um, so that's an approach which is not the approach we're going to take here. Here we're going to talk about the density approach in higher dimension. And how do we do the density approach? Well, we take derivatives, right? <laughs> So just a bit of notation. So um, E1 up to ED will always be the canonical basis for coordinates in RD. Uh, this norm thing will always be the Euclidean norm. And then we can uh, look at the directional Stein derivative in direction E as the partial derivative of P times F divided by P. So F is an object for which this partial derivative is defined. So we could think of F being uh, real valued, uh, vector valued, we could think of it as, as a matrix valued function. So as soon as we can have the partial derivative, we have our directional Stein derivative. So the directional Stein derivative is the building block of our Stein operators. So a Stein operator or Stein standardization, as we call it, is any operator of the form, which is a, a combination of directional Stein operators so evaluate at a thumb linear operator times the function g of interest and multiplied by some matrix A. So these are just uh, A and, and T of linear operators. And the Stein class is then the collection of all functions g such that APG is integrable and has mean zero under P, when with P is the true distribution. So the, the ones which we are uh, particularly interested in here are the uh, Stein gradient operator, um, where we just take the gradient of P times the function divided by P. Um, this is often called this Stein operator for multivariate distributions. Um, but you can also think of the Stein divergence operator, where we just sum up the directional derivatives that gives us the divergence of P times the, target, uh, the, the function F uh, divided by P. So for the multivariate normal, we can calculate the uh, um, directional derivatives of the directional Stein operators, and we get two Stein equations out. So the, uh, the gradient Stein equation has, well, the gradient G of X uh, minus sigma to the minus one X minus mu G of X. And the uh, divergence characterization has the divergence of G of X minus uh, sigma to the minus one x minus u and uh, g of x. So these are different operators. You see, although they are they're clearly related, they also operate in different spaces. And we have our product rule. So as as in the one dimensional case, we have the um, multivariate product rule. So we get um, operators uh, which depend on f and g, which is g times operator t at f plus f times the partial derivative of g. And if the left-hand side integrates to zero, so if we've got a Stein, f times g is in the Stein class, then we again get um, a whole uh, um, plethora of Stein equations. Expectation g of uh, tf is minus expectation f of partial derivative of g. So in here, it's, we denote by p, the subscript p, the expectation um, with respect to which we integrate. And uh, with uh, Guillaume Mijoul and uh, Yves Swan, we've proved this result that this actually works. 
so in the sense that um, under regularity assumption, uh, P is equal to Q if and only if for all directions on the unit sphere, the expectation under Q of G uh, to F is equal to minus the expectation under Q of F times the partial derivative of G. For all G, which uh, in a domain which depends on P as well as F. So this, this is a set of smooth functions where we've got integrability um, conditions. So in particular, G T F plus F partial G is a Stein operator for P. For any, so I can again fix F and choose my G. So which F should we fix, okay? So, um, For, so we have gradient-based operators. Um, so for gradient, we get uh, expectation Q um, to gradient F is minus expectation Q F gradient G. And the corresponding Stein operator is here, G gradient operator F plus F gradient G. And for divergence, similarly, um, we get the operator G, the divergence operator at F plus F times the gradient of G. So here, this is for matrix valued F, and this one is for real valued F. So there's different domains here, but we can we can sort of switch between domains. We will see that in a moment. So so in this uh, um, gradient operator, we can take F equal to one as before, and that gives us again the score function. So T of one is the gradient of log P is the score function, and the score Stein operator is this vector valued operator a gradient G plus score function times G. This operator is used, for example, in Stein gradient descent, where Liu and Wang, and um, so, it's, so it's generally very popular exactly because it does not depend on the normalizing constant and it's, uh, so the gradient is attractive. Um, we can also look at divergence based operators and we will talk more about those here. So if P has mean mu, I can again choose F such that the Stein operator evaluated at F is nu minus the identity if that's allowed. So this is what gave us um, Stein kernels in one dimension. And if this is, uh, if we can find it such an F, that's called a Stein kernel in, for P in higher dimension. And we did note it by Tau. And corresponding, we can get a um, Tau kernel Stein operator. Um, uh, uh, which if I take the, the divergence, I just get a uh, total gradient G minus the identity minus new times G. And uh, if G, I could think of G itself being a gradient, then we can get a second order um, Stein operator, which is more commonly used, um, which is the Hilbert Schmidt inner product between Tau and the um, Hessian of G minus identity minus mu times the gradient of G. Um, in a product with a gradient of G. So, so why is this um, useful? So we're going to talk a bit more about multivariate sign kernels and how they can be useful. So remind you, so this is how I just defined a Stein kernel so that the uh, divergence operator evaluated at tau is nu minus the identity. So Stein kernels, multivariate Stein kernels have been introduced in a, a series of paper by Nodin and Picati and Yves Horn, 2013-14 uh, for um, mu equal to zero. Um, so if you've got an operator such that um, this uh, characterizing equation, expectation to P phi, so that to P gradient phi is expectation P X phi for all phi continues with compact support, that's called a strong kind Stein kernel for P. And in uh, Cotard and uh, Fatih and Pananjadi, it has been proved that Stein kernels are, exist, exist and are unique under spectrograph, exist and unique within a certain Sobolev space and under many assumptions. But yes, following up from a question earlier, existence of the Stein kernel in general is uh, far from obvious. Ledoux et al. In 2015, used a second order characterization for what they then call a weak Stein kernel. So we only have the Hessian here. 
So there, there are subtle differences. So for our Stein kernel, we yeah. can actually. Yeah. So, sorry, uh, just a question before. Uh, so it is pretty, so you mentioned spectral gap for the existence and a uniqueness, but the spectral gap of what can you? Oh, uh, the, it, if the distribution has a satisfies the Poincaré inequality. Okay. So not not of Markov process, but of the distribution itself. So. So if it has a Poincaré inequality, it satisfies Poincaré inequality, we say it's got a spectral gap. Okay, thanks. A good question. So here's a construction for a Stein kernel. Um, so we can, we can uh, if we can find a matrix F such that for some constants alpha and beta, uh, which together sum up to not zero and the function R, which is R devalued, f of x times the score function of x is alpha times mu minus x, mu being the mean, plus r of x, and the divergence f of x is beta mu minus x minus r of x, then tau, which is 1 divided by alpha plus beta f, gives us a Stein kernel. So the Stein kernel might not satisfy the regularities which you're interested in, but as soon as you can calculate the score function, you can make an ansatz in trying to solve these equations. And this way, so we, we've done that for, um, for various distributions. For example, of course, for the multivariate normal with mean mu and covariant sigma, then the constant function, uh, which is just the uh, sigma, the covariance matrix, that's a Stein kernel for gamma. And here's the first order operator, which corresponds to it, but also, if I let, I abbreviate T as X minus mu transpose sigma to the min, minus one X minus mu over two, which appears in the exponent of the, uh, the density. And then for delta not equal to two, we've got a whole family of Stein kernels. Um, two delta of X is one over two minus delta D minus one. So this is for D larger than one um, and times D minus one plus two T times one minus delta sigma minus one minus delta, and then we've got x minus mu, x minus mu transpose. So we have some kind of linear combination between the covariance matrix uh, and the empirical covariance matrix. So x minus mu, x minus mu transpose. And if, if delta is equal to one, then of course we only see the covariance matrix and we recover the original, um, the the Stein kernel, which is usually used for the for the normal, but there are actually a whole um, zoo of Stein kernels available. And similarly for the student distribution. So um, we, we again, we have a parameter delta. For, um, for the student distribution, um, using multivariate covariance inequalities, Lanzmann and Nehuslova, um derive what we would call a Stein kernel as t plus k times sigma, divided by d plus k minus two, where t is again, the uh, x minus mu transpose sigma to the minus one x minus mu over two. But if d is larger than one, we again have a whole range of Stein kernels. Now, for example, I can specify a Stein kernel to get x minus mu x minus mu transpose plus k times sigma divided by k minus one. So we, we've got a whole, whole range of Stein kernels. So we will see in a moment, how we can play with the delta. Um, and for that, we have to talk a little bit. Oh, someone raised a hand. The question? Yeah, the question, if I could, is that an exhaustive uh, list of what's possible for Stein kennels in that case? Or that's just the ones no. you found? No, this is, uh, so this is what we, what we found making this ansatz, but setting r equal to zero. Mm -hmm. So you can play with r uh, in a different way and then get a, Get, get many more Stein kernels. Mm -hmm. and, and do you have any intuition about why there's a one parameter family that's possible there? Well, so this, the Stein kernel, um, they're really only characterized by this divergence, right? And mm -hmm. so as soon as I add something to tau, which is divergence free, I get another Stein kernel. Mm -hmm. And in the one dimensional case, that's not a problem because the divergence is just the first derivative. So you can't do much wrong. But maybe it was just, it was just that you were, you, it was the interpolation between two. So I was sort of trying to understand the significance of 
the two things that were being interpolated. In here? Yeah. Because delta equal to one takes out the one on the right. Mm -hmm. yes. And I guess if you choose delta wisely, then you take out the one on the left. Yes. Yes, so if you choose so, delta, so, delta, so I'm delta, trying to see the significance of okay, sigma is, is at the starting block, but then the other one, where does that come from? Is it natural to see where that comes from? That's a good question. So, I mean, intuitively, so sigma is the the covariance matrix, and you can Deform. if you have the empirical covariance matrix, if you take the expectation. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe it's natural that it doesn't matter whether you take the empirical or the the true one. Of course, it does matter because the coefficient is different and you have different. Um, Thanks anyway. But, but it's um, it's, a, it's a good question. So if we want to use um, Stein's method to compare distributions, um, we start with the with the Stein equation as Evic did. So we have H minus EPH as APF, and then. I, for any PDF Q, I can take expectation under Q on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, and I get that the expectation of H under Q minus the expectation of H under P is exactly the expectation under Q of APF. So if F is now such that uh, expectation Q, A, Q, F is zero, then I can take um, the expectation of Q, A, Q, F away from this equation here, and um, subtracting these operators, if we use the Stein operator, so this is um, the, the first order uh, kernel Stein operator, which we used, uh, which, which we introduced it before, you see they've got a common term xf of x. I assume here that mu is equal to zero. And this, this is just the difference between the Stein kernels times the gradient f of x. So, with this comparison of operators, it's natural to introduce this Stein kernel discrepancy, which is actually the Stein discrepancy, which Evik talked about for general distribution, as the, well, here we use the Hilbert Schmidt norm between uh, the two Stein kernels. We square it and we take the square root of the expectation of the Hilbert Schmidt norm. So in one dimension, um, this reduces it exactly to what Evik did. And here we take the infimum over all Stein kernels for P1 and for B2. So this was um, yeah, introduced in Nodon, Picatti and Swan 2014, Gorham, Maki 2017. So this, this uh, Stein discrepancy is, is sort of a natural object. And for the student versus standard normal, we can actually play with the delta, with the, with the characterization. So if I take two one uh, being the identity, so just uh, for standard normal, the, the easy Stein kernel, as it were, and I look at the different Stein kernels for the students, then I get different bounds on the Stein discrepancy. So if I take the one from Lanzmann and Neheslova, I get the first bound, so the square root of two d times d plus root two divided by d plus k minus two. And if I take the, uh, the second Stein operator, which I wrote down, um, x minus mu, x minus mu transpose plus k times sigma, uh, this would be that divided by k minus one. So this gives the square root of d times five plus d divided by k minus one. So we get different bounds. But we can also optimize over delta and we did it only for d equal to two. But optimizing this, um, we got a, the optimal bound is, uh, well, this, this expression here, square root of 40 divided by eight plus k times three k minus four. And this is achieved at delta, which is one minus, um, Four of 2k minus 3 divided by 3k squared plus 4k minus 4. So if k goes to infinity, delta goes to 1, and we get the um, Stein kernel uh, just in terms of, of the variance. And also we know that the student would tend to the normal with, because k is the degree of freedom. And so, so that, that's a plausible result. But this is, this is the way how this flexibility in the Stein kernels can be exploited. But um, as Evik said, quite often we actually don't want to uh, just have Stein discrepancies. We might want to compare operators in Wasserstein distance. So the Wasserstein distance he's already introduced. So this is just the supremum over all Lipschitz function H 
of the difference in the expectations under the different probabilities we want to compare. So if you've got a Stein operator for P1 and a solution of the Stein equation A1G, which is H minus EP1, then the expectation of P2H under the expect minus expectation of P1H is the expectation of P2 under P2 of A1G, this is just the Stein equation, but I can subtract A2G, but have to um, add it back in expectation P2 A2G. Because this expectation, the second expectation under P2 may not vanish. In the one dimensional case, the Stein classes are quite transparent, but here it's quite possible to have a function G, which is in the Stein class of A1, but not in the Stein class of A2. So this expectation appears. But not to worry, we can include it in our Wasserstein bounds. So for example, um, here, this is uh, for the operator AIG, which is the second order divergence operator, but we could do it for other operators. Um, then we get a bound on the Wasserstein distance, which is the supremum of the difference of the Stein operators plus a term kappa two of F1 of F2, which I will show you the proof in a minute, relates to exactly the fact that under the second, um, and under P2, the Stein operator may not vanish. And here we have um, functions G um, in the set of A1, but we also need that G is such that um, the Stein operator, so it also has to be in the domain of the second Stein operator. So I just wrote such G because I, I was lazy and I, the, the slide was busy enough, but so there are conditions on G. So let's let's prove this. So this is really what Stein's method um, does. So I thought it would be good to include the proof. So we have our Stein equation, um, expectation pH minus EPH1. And this is um, the uh, Stein operator solution of the Stein equation for G. And so we take expectation under P2. So what I do now is I add in the operator under P2 and I subtract it. So we've got the differences because we've got the two operators of the same form. We've got the difference of the divergences of um, under P1 for F1 and under P2 of F2 times the gradient of G. And I've got the differences between F1 and F2 times the uh, um, Hessian of G and Hilbert Schmidt. Now. And I'm also left with this expectation of the second sign operator, which I have to add back in but by the product rule, this is just the, the integral over the divergence of F2 transpose than the gradient P of G times P2. So this is, so if this combination here has divergence zero, uh, we don't have this additional term, otherwise we have to take the term into account and we just take supreme to, to do this. So you can also see um, from this, this proof that there are a couple of things to note. So first of all, Again, of course, we want to play with F1 and F2. Maybe we want to make this term to, to disappear or maybe we want to make the diverged term to, to disappear. So either way, if, if that choice is, is allowed, um, we, we can get results. Um, also something that we will come back to later, what we really only use in this proof is the first equation here. So the fact that G solves the A1 Stein equation it's actually only used through taking expectations under P2 of this equation. Yeah, I, I, I don't, so this is, um, this is just note. So particular case is nested densities. So if P1 and P2 are nested and pi zero is P2 divided by P1. So nested means they have the same support uh, the radom Nicodem uh, derivative um, exists. Then we can uh, calculate via the product rule that the divergence operator under P2 of F is the divergence operator under P1 of F plus F times the gradient of the log of pi zero, so log of P2 over P1. And so if I choose F1 equal to F2 in the, the previous expression uh, equal to to one, which is a Stein kernel, to one then we get a bound on Wasserstein distance, which depends on well, the supremum of all the solutions of the gradient G of X 
times the expectation of T1 of the Stein kernel times the gradient of pi zero plus this uh, kappa two term of the Stein kernel. And we can actually also show um, a lower bound on this on the Wasserstein distance by using that the lower bound, we can, can take a, a special test functions, expectations as test functions. And so to show why this is useful, here's an example, you can look at the effect of the prior on the posterior. And uh, so we have a normal model, uh, variance is known, we want to estimate uh, theta. We have two priors, uh, one is uh, uniform, the second one is a normal prior. And then we can get a bound on the Wasserstein distance, which depends um, um, on the data. So on X bar, the closer X bar is to mu, the, the smaller the bound is. Um, it also depends on N, the sample size. So that's a term which, uh, so we will have some, some error term, even if X bar is identical to, to mu. Um, but it's as it should be, the, the bound depends on the data. So, uh, so that's uh, one application. So now going back to this fact that our proof uh, only used this, what you could call a weak sign equation, right? The expectation of H minus expectation P1H is the expectation of P2 of the Stein operator evaluated at G. And if I got a nested PDFs, then I can calculate the, uh, uh, I can man manipulate this, this equation uh, to get that expectation P1H minus expectation P1H is just minus expectation P2 of the inner product of F1 times the gradient of log pi zero times the gradient of G. This is just by expanding and using the fact that it's nested. Okay, so now here we have something so if I let that F1 being say identity kernel, then I've got something that's gradient, gradient in a product of gradient equal solution. And this is something that people have looked at in um, functional analysis a lot. So here's assume that we've got a Poincaré constant. We've got a Sobolev space of functions, which I'm, so I've written it down here once. I'm not going uh, to go into detail, but what we can show is that if the PDF has a Poincaré constant P1, then we can find a solution such that the expectation of P1 of this inner product um, of grad V, um, grad G, is the expectation under P1 of H minus expectation P1H times V. And the uh, expectation of P1 of the gradient of G squared is bounded um, by the square of the Poincaré constant. So this is Ries representation theorem. So this, um, this is the general theorem, but you see it's of the form that we used in, um, in our equation. So if I take F1 minus identity, we can conclude because the distributions are nested with P1 and P2, that the, so the expectation P1 translates directly into an expectation of P2 and the expectation of, we have a solution G of this expectation equation and the solution is bounded in expectation. And so the, the gradient squared of the solution is bounded using the Poincaré constant. And so we directly get a bound in Wasserstein distance between the nested distributions without having to solve a single Stein equation. So we, we know that it exists the solution which has this regularity um, property. And there we are. So we can use this, for example, to um, compare copulas. I'm going to skip this slide um, because I want to talk a little bit about uh, shrinkage and Stein at the end. So Stein is actually in, in the wider statistics community is probably better known for the Stein unbiased risk estimator and sh shrinkage than for Stein's method. So um, what is uh, the unbiased risk estimator? So it starts with the problem, the observe a multivariate normal um, let's say the covariance matrix is sigma squared times the identity and the mean is theta, and we want to estimate theta. So how do we estimate it? We estimate theta by a function which is x plus f of x. So that's very general. So natural, um, people thought it would be natural to just take x, so we don't know the mean, well, we estimate it by the observed x. 
So what's the risk in that? So the risk is, um, so this is the squared with x of x minus theta squared. So s of x is x uh, minus f plus f of x, and we take theta away. And so we can expand this and get x minus theta squared plus f of x, the norm squared, plus twice the inner product between x minus theta and f of x. But in the multivariate normal, the, the Stein characterization gives us the expectation of x minus theta f of x is sigma squared times the expectation of the identity times the gradient f of x. So this is beautiful because there's no theta anymore on the right-hand side. The theta is gone, right? And so we can get an unbiased estimator for the risk by taking, well, sigma squared d, which is the expectation of the first term, plus f of x squared, which doesn't depend on theta, plus twice sigma squared times the inner product of the identity and gradient f of x. So a special case is f of x is minus lambda times x over the norm of x squared, which is the one which is related to shrinkage. So we can calculate the gradient f of x. And the resulting um, estimator, sure to Stein unbiased risk estimator, is then sigma squared d plus lambda over x squared times lambda minus 2 sigma squared times d minus 2. Now, for lambda is equal to 0, we just get sigma squared d. But there is a range for lambda where the mean square error is actually smaller than sigma squared d because the second term is less than, uh, less than zero. So the, uh, the estimators for the, the mean, which, are, which have smaller mean square error than the standard estimate sigmas. So this, this actually shook the statistics world in, uh, 50 years ago. So how about other distributions? So here's again what we did for the, for the shore. So again, we have our expansion in x minus theta f of x. But now, OK, we don't have the identity, but we have the Stein kernel. So I can replace, I can take the expectation here and get the expectation of the Stein kernel times gradient f of x. And the Stein kernel is for x minus theta. So in the construction of, of the Stein kernel, theta does not appear anymore. And so this suggests as an uh, estimator what we call um, the kernel shore, because it depends on the sign kernel. So it's sigma squared d time uh, plus f of x squared plus twice the inner product of the Stein kernel and the gradient f of x. So this will be unbiased for the risk. And again, we can look at the special case of shrinkage. And we can see that um, we, we again have the phenomenon, uh, well, the, the bound for the for the mean square error is like the bound in the in the normal case plus a term uh, b lambda which depends on the Stein kernel. But we can show that the Stein kernel, so so this uh, b lambda under what can we say reasonable assumption on the distribution, so that it's not not uh, um, so so the uh, the inverse fourth moment is finite uh, when it grows with d the variance of the Stein kernel is order d squared and the Hilbert Schmidt norm squared of Stein kernel minus sigma squared identity is little o of d squared. Then this term with b lambda is little o of d and the risk of the, the shrinkage estimator one minus lambda over x squared times x is no larger than having this for lambda equal to zero when lambda is in this uh, range. So again, we have the shrinkage phenomenon. And this, these assumptions are satisfied, for example, for a student distribution. So uh, I calculated only in even dimensions d because it's uh, odd is uh, yet a different case. And, but, but then we've got these assumptions satisfied and um, we get an explicit bound and the bound uh, requires that d divided by k um, goes to infinities. Um, so it's a little o of d. So k has to go to infinity with, with dimension. So we, um, so when dimension goes to infinity, the um, degrees of freedom of the student distribution also has to go to infinity. So of course, shrinkage for other distribution has been looked at by other people. So Eldar looked at exponential families and Frodenier, Stroderman and Wells have a book uh, where they mentioned spherically symmetric um, 
distributions and chain weasel here also. Evans and Stark have a, a stopping time construction. Um, but we think we, we add sort of a new dimension and we get explicit bounds. And plus, we can play with, uh, with the Stein kernels. So we have for this whole range of Stein kernels which can exploit for the shrinkage estimator because the, yeah, so, so the shrinkage estimator depends on the Stein kernel, but um, we can try to find Stein kernels such that these, um, these, these error terms are as small as possible. We haven't done that yet. Actually, it's um, time for last remarks, I think. So what have I talked about? But first of all, for Stein's method, um, finding a suitable Stein equation is crucial. And our framework gives a large, actually infinite choice of Stein equations to choose from. Um, second, weak Stein equations and existence of solutions with desired, desired properties may suffice depending on your problem. So explicit solutions are not always required. And this, this uh, might, might be a good way forward for some problems. And of course, the effect of the prior on the posterior is it's a big problem based in analysis will be studied in more detail. There's the whole Bernstein von Mises approximation field, which is sort of lurking in the distance. Uh, sure, and shrinkage for other distributions, again, there's much more to explore. And we are also thinking about the multivariate discrete case, um, as, as mentioned before. And that's all I wanted to say. Oh, I, I, something that I forgot to mention, mustn't do this. Um, this theorem that it works actually with Max Fati, with Larry Goldstein, this is myself, and with Adrian Soma. So this, this work about uh, uh, sure and shrinkage is all work with Max and Larry and Adrian. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Gizin. Uh, so first of all, I would um, invite, uh, sorry, I have, uh, okay, uh, I had a problem. So I would invite everybody to unmute so that uh, we can uh, thank all together Gizin for this nice talk. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks. So, uh, I know, uh, Gizini, uh, oh, should I share again? Uh, yeah, yeah, so you should uh, share again, please. Okay. So it's, right. uh, we have uh, some time for questions. Okay. And it's, uh, it can be useful to have uh, your slides. Uh, mm -hmm. this. Okay. So is there uh, any question? So I have a question. Uh, so you have talked mainly about the design divergence operator. But at a certain moment, you introduce also, you mention also the sign gradient operator. Mm -hmm. So is there some advantage uh, to work with one operator uh, than the other? Or uh, so in some cases, uh, at least in some, uh, for some problems? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a very good question. So uh, Stein's method is, has become quite popular in machine learning and there are people pretty much always use the gradient operator because gradients fit in sort of very nicely with machine learning questions. So there's a connection with Colbert library divergence, which can be explored in order to optimize on gradient descent, for example. So, so in that region, um, the, uh, the, the gradient Stein operators are the ones which are usually used. And this is what many people think of the Stein operators. And, they're, and, and they link in to to of course, so stochastic differential equations, uh, stochastic processes. And here the, um, the Stein kernels uh, have been less explored. Um, and this is partly why I wanted to talk about them more, why they had more focus. Um, I think partly people find them difficult to construct, difficult to understand, difficult to see whether they exist or not exist, and also difficult to see what's the point. And so, so therefore we, we put in quite a lot of work in trying to make clear you know, how can we construct a Stein kernel? What is the point? And the whole connection with the uh, um, Stein's unbiased risk estimator, I think it's a, it's a good point. I should say the, uh, the Stein's unbiased risk estimator, there's also connection with zero bias coupling, which I haven't talked about at all. So the Stein kernels can be interpreted. Now there, there's a connection uh, with a 
probabilistic coupling called the zero bias coupling. So the Stein kernel um, can be seen as a density of a zero bias coupling distribution. But I didn't want to confuse people further. No. Okay, thanks. Uh, is there uh, some question? I also ask one question. Okay, please. Thank you. Basically, thank you for an excellent presentation. Basically, some of those results at least are known. I think also those the priors from Gadrin, Jat, and Lay and others. But mm -hmm. I was thinking basically today you have, I will not say competing, but additional approach using Malyaven, calculus to Stein, probably even uh, Swan, Eric Swan talked about this in the mm -hmm. first part. Uh, which of those results that you mentioned, the priors, the weak solutions, kernels, can be generalized using Maria van Stein, which is a topic of big explorations today. Um, okay, so we have not looked into that in detail. So um, for the Maria van Stein calculus, you need a, a certain setup. So it works very well for Gaussian approximations or for approximation. So basically you're, the distribution that you want to approximate, your, your target distribution has to, can, has to be expressed as a as function of a um, distribution which, is, uh, which has a chaos decomposition. So like a Wiener chaos decomposition or Rademacher chaos decomposition. And when you have this kind of target distribution, then the stein malia approach is very powerful. So, so um, the, the uh, uh, high level reply is that, um, so, so for example, the, for the Gaussian, we have the, uh, uh, the Wiener chaos, and so um, standard operation might be very good. Uh, when you look at student operators, um, that's a different stories. So the more structure you have on your target distribution, uh, the more advantages you have or the, 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 you've got other other tools available from science method. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Is there uh, some other question? Any other question? So, so, so I just have a question. Maybe it's um, a bit a bit naive, but with for some shrinkage results, um, I can see the that the computation works, but intuitively it, it feels bizarre. Do, do you have some intuition to to sort of explain what's going on there? <laughs> um, so you mean uh, just Stein shrinkage? That, that's right. Yeah. Um. Not, not really. It's a dimension thing. It's, it's a. I suppose I, I don't understand RD well enough to to give you a good intuition. So. So in in the in the calculations, um, we look at the volume of the unit ball in R in RD, and of course you know that that. Uh, so so how that behaves as as D goes to infinity or as D grows, and and that's. Uh, it's not not really completely intuitive, so I, I don't think I've got a good answer. But other people in the audience might have a good answer for it. It is it is mind boggling, and it's one of these things which uh, uh, Charles Stein himself was trying to prove the admissibility of this estimator as zero for a long time until he, he talked to someone else in Stanford at, in the coffee room, I think, on the corridor. Uh, that person sa said, but is it actually true? And then within a week, he could show that, no, it was not true. It was not admissible. And this is a better estimator. OK, thank you. Can I just add, I apologize to this question of Amanda Turner, that today there is a lot of research on confidence intervals related to Stein uh, shrinkage and so on, more or less in econometrics and other fields. So this is very actual, just to add, I'm sorry to intervene. No, no, it's fine. Thank you. Thanks. Is there uh, any other question? Mm. Okay, so maybe it's also time. Sorry, I have a 
I, I'm getting crazy a little with my computer. <laughs> Problem. I have too many open windows, so um, maybe so it's also time uh, uh, to stop if uh, there is uh, no other question. So first of all, I would um, ask. Uh, uh, okay, maybe I'm okay. I would invite everybody to unmute so that we can uh, thank both the speakers for these uh, very nice talks. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And uh, okay, I wish uh, to meet uh, everybody again next uh, week for uh, the last talk before the Eastern break. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay, if you want, you can uh, stop sharing. So I stop. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you